special guest, although he's not really a guest because he grew up here, but, and we get to see him every now and then. He's been gone for a while, and he's been with us the last couple of weeks. Our brother Luke Mueller, would you stand, please? Thank you for your service, Luke. As he's serving in the Marines, uh, he goes back today. He came to church this morning, and he goes as soon as church is over to back out to Camp Pendleton, San Diego. Thanks for being here, Luke. We, we are proud of you. That's one of ours. <laughs> God bless you as well. Amen. <coughs> well, this is God's good. All the time. All the time, God is good. That's right. And uh, I, I missed, maybe some of you don't know, but some of you remember, you know, every about every week we get a bag of Tootsie Rolls up here, and I'm missing my Tootsie Roll. Uh, <laughs> for Ron Ellis, you know, usually he found out I like Tootsie Rolls, and some of the other staff like Tootsie Rolls, and so he just made it a point to, he said he was going to sit back here and throw them at me. Uh, uh, I said, yeah, I'm going to that's okay, I guess, but it might not go over so well. You know? But uh, anyway, I, I miss those Tootsie Rolls. And it just brings to my attention today that uh, we need to really be praying for Ron and Ellen as uh, Ellen has, has quickly deteriorated with the cancer that's taken place. And um, Yesterday, Susie and I were able to go out there yesterday and pray with her and sing with her. We sang Amazing Grace. She just sat and cried. She can't really sit up by herself. Ron has to pick her up and move her wherever she goes and, and uh, just try to sit her in a chair. And she couldn't even sit up. She would just lean over, kept leaning to the one side. He had to hold her up and just lay her, lay her down on the, on the couch. So be praying for Ron and Ellen during these days and that family. Uh, she won't be with us much longer unless the Lord intervenes. And he's certainly able to do that. But be praying for them. And uh, Ron said... Pastor, you don't know how much I, I want to be there at church. But he said, she's my life. Amen. And I need to be here for her. I said, this is where you need to be. Right here. This is the most godly thing you can do is to be here with your wife. So pray for them uh, as you think about them this week and the days to come. I invite your attention this morning to the book of Ephesians in your Bibles, if you would please. Ephesians chapter 1. As we gain some words from God's Word through the Apostle Paul to us. So if you have your Bibles open there in Ephesians, just leave them there. We'll get to that in just a little bit, I promise we will. Back to my old habits, aren't they? <laughs> but shall we begin by reciting our motto together once again today, all together? Heavenly Father, I give you permission to speak to me. To speak through me, to do whatever you want with my life. I trust the leadership of your Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank God. Even more so this new year, those words will become a part of our life. Well, welcome today on this first Sunday of 2016. Woo. Did we ever think it'd come? Most of us, we didn't think it would happen, did we? But it's here. And some of you have probably been working on your New Year's resolutions. Right? <laughs> but on the other hand, it's only been three days. And some of you have probably already given up on your New Year's resolutions. <laughs> like one poor guy I heard about tried praying, praying about his resolutions. And he got down beside his bed one night, closed his eyes, and offered this earnest prayer. Lord, in 2016, my prayer for the new year is a fat bank account and a thin body. And please don't mix these up like you did last year. Uh, <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> One conscientious man kept a careful record of his past resolutions regarding dieting. And here are his resolutions by the year. 2011... I will get my weight down below 180 pounds. Year 2012. I will follow my new diet religiously until I get below 200 pounds. <laughs> 2013. 
I will develop a realistic attitude about my weight. 2014. I will work out three days a week. 2015. I will try to drive past the gym at least once a week. <laughs> and the reason I have a copy of his resolutions is that finally he gave up all together and threw his re record of the past resolutions in the trash where his wife retrieved it and gave it to me. I'm not going to give any names, I promise. <laughs> Someone has said that New Year's resolutions is something that goes in one ear and out the other. <clears throat> That's about true, isn't it? And someone else said that every year I make a resolution to change myself. This year I'm making a resolution to be myself. That's not a bad resolution right there. Really, it's not. In fact, one December 31st, years ago, Charles Schultz in his Peanuts cartoon strip had Snoopy the dog think to himself, so this is the last year, last day of the year, another complete year gone by, and what have I accomplished this year that I haven't accomplished every other year? Nothing. He smiles and thinks to himself, how consistent can you get? <laughs> well, <laughs> this year, if if you've made New Year's resolutions, I trust that God will give you the grace to accomplish them. If not, I trust that God will give you the grace to accept yourself as you are and at least to admire your consistency <laughs> in one way or another. Someone has offered this toast for a new year. For those of us who are getting a few years on us now, I thought you might enjoy it, so I thought I'd share it with you today. Here's how it goes. May your hair, your teeth, and your face lift, your abs, and your stocks not fall. May your blood pressure, your triglycerides, your cholesterol, your white blood count, and your mortgage interest not rise. May you get a clean bill of health from your dentist, your cardiologist, your gastroenterologist, your urologist, your proctologist, your podiatrist, your psychiatrist, your plumber, and the IRS. May you find a way to travel from anywhere to anywhere else during rush hour in less than an hour, and when you get there, may you find a parking space. May what you see in the mirror delight you, and what others see in you delight them. May the telemarketers wait to make their sales calls until you finish dinner. And may your checkbook and your budget balance. And may they include generous amounts for your church and charities. May you remember to say I love you at least once a day to your spouse, your child, and your parents. Not bad, is it? That last one leads us right into our message for today. Our theme for today is God's adopted children. Let's look now at the words from the Apostle Paul to the church at Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 3, beginning down to verse 6. For Paul says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he has chosen us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one he loves. May God add his blessing to this, his word this morning. Did you hear what he said? Look at verse 5. That God has predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ. What an amazing thought that is. That this is the meaning of your life and mine. It's the very meaning of our life. Because of what 
what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. We are sons and daughters of God. Do you realize what a, what a privilege? Do you realize what a pleasure that is? What an honor that is to be called sons and daughters of God. Imagine what that could mean as we be begin a new year. What does it mean? Well, first of all, it means that we are loved. We are loved. And if you have any question that God loves you, then put it out of your mind. Because we are loved. And if you need to say, the preacher told me so, then I tell you so. <laughs> but so does God's word. In fact, in Psalm 8, the 8th Psalm, we read in Psalm 8, verses 3 and 4, the psalmist said, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. <coughs> that is a legitimate question. This universe is so huge. Why in the world should God care about me and you? <coughs> Why should He care about us at all? Dr. Harry Emerson Fosdick dealt with this question many years ago in his book entitled The Meaning of Prayer. And I have dealt with Dr. Fosdick's arguments before, but they're, they're so compelling that they are a good reminder of things we ought to know as we begin a new year. But Dr. Fosdick reminds us that we don't always judge value based on size. We don't always judge value based on size. We may be just a tiny part of creation, but that doesn't lessen our value. One little bit. Not at all. In fact, you probably remember while we were still children, we, we learned that a dime has more value than a nickel. Right? You remember learning that lesson? Even though the nickel is larger, the dime has more value. So value is not determined by size. Not completely. <coughs> In fact, think about it with me. You, you can dig a two-ton rock out of the ground and it will not be as valuable as a two-ounce diamond. Right? And then you put that diamond on the third finger of the left hand of a woman and its value increases significantly. Right? We won't go into wish lists. We don't love a baby any less because of its size. There's just something about a baby that we love even more because it's small sometimes, right? And if we don't judge value on the basis of size, why should God? Think about it. <coughs> If we don't judge value on the basis of size, why should God? And yet, so often, we do that, don't we, with God? We may be just a tiny part of God's creation, but we're far from insignificant. Because every bit of evidence from both theology and from science supports the, the proposition that this world was created in our behalf and we are the most prized creatures in creation. We are. But, you may argue, there are so many of us for God to love. There are so many of us for God to love. How in the world is he going to pick me out of the crowd? out of the masses of people? That's a good question. You know there are over 7 billion people in the world today. There are over 7 people on earth. How in the world could God know and care about each one of us as individuals? How could that happen? 
Is God like the old woman who lived in the shoe who had so many children she didn't know what to do? <laughs> no. Dr. Fosdick helps us here as well. He reminds us that the more you know about any subject, the less you think in terms of universal or the general, and the more you think in terms of the specific or the individual. Hmm. It's a good thought. And as I thought about what Dr. Fosdick said, uh, it just kind of helped me to think about it in some different terms. Maybe I can help illustrate it this morning for you. <coughs> An illiterate man wanders into a large downtown library. And on either side, there are rows upon rows of books. What do they mean to him? He can't read. What does he see? Don't you imagine that he, he sees just one big sea of books? My, he says, look at all those books, just a bunch of books, all very much alike. That's what he sees. But what about the librarian? What do they see? Probably not a blob of books. In fact, they've seen these books come in from publishers and they have helped sort them and catalog them. They've checked them out to people. They've reshelled them. They've hunted some of them down for their clients. They probably have read a lot of them. They think in terms of individual books. <coughs> Individual authors, individual subject matters. And the more people know about books, the less they view them as a sea of literature, and the more they view them as individual titles. They have names. Here's another way to look at it. <laughs> Most of us, I, I, I'm just going out on a limb here. <coughs> Most of us know nothing about what goes on under the hood of a car. There are a few of you here that do, of course. And today, most cars come with all kinds of standard features such as power steering, power brakes, air conditioning, cruise control, navigation systems, and, and of course computers that control everything. They make them so complicated. But these features make things a, a lot more complicated than they used to be. When I used to be able to change my own I think. <laughs> <laughs> but suppose we, suppose we had a car trouble out on a road somewhere. And we open the hood of the car. And what do we see? We probably see a meaningless mass of metal and wires and rubber. Makes no sense to us at all. Some of you, a few of you are sitting there, well, I see you. You can name it right off the bat. You probably know what's wrong with that car. <laughs> I like something that author and pastor John Ortberg says. He says this. If my car breaks down, I sometimes look under the hood. I have no idea why. <laughs> because if under the hood there were a giant on and off switch turned to the off position, I would have some idea what to do. Aren't you like that? I am. Well, Ortberg says he ends up doing what most of us do. He throws up his hands in frustration and calls for a tow truck. <laughs> and a mechanic at the garage looks under the hood, but he doesn't see a mass of metal wires and rubber. He sees individual parts positioned in the correct places and he, he runs a diagnostic computer test and then repairs the car without even having to search for the defective part because he knows exactly where to find it in that mess under the hood. You see, the more you know about cars, the more you understand its individual parts. Mm -hmm. And here's one last.
last example and probably the most important one. Suppose you and I would take a trip to Mexico City or Tokyo, two of the largest cities in the world. And we go downtown, and it's rush hour, and there are thousands of busy people in the streets. What, what is our first impression likely to be? <clears throat> we'll probably just see a great mass of faces that all look alike to us. If we were to stay a while in one of those great cities and came to know and love certain people there and understood their culture, they would no longer all look the same to us. We would see them as individuals, as friends, people we like to be around. You see, God knows every single person in the world by name. God knows every single person by name. He knows every Israeli and Palestinian by name. He knows every child in Zambia and South Africa by name. He knows every Saudi and every Iranian by name. He knows all of us by name. And the more you know about any subject, the less you think in general terms and the more you think in individual terms. <coughs> That's how God knows about you and cares about you Amen. and me. Amen. God knows everything about every one of us. He is the source of all knowledge and truth. He doesn't see us as just a sea of humanity. He sees us and loves us as individuals. We are loved. In the minds of many people today, the most important question that, that haunts their lives is this one question. Is the universe friendly? And the answer we have to give them is a firm and unyielding yes, it is. The universe is friendly. Why? Because God loves us individually just as we are. You, you are a child of God. Amen. And you're valuable to Him. Amen. Number two, the second thing this means <coughs> as we face this new year, that in Jesus Christ, God has adopted us to be His own children. He has adopted us to be His own children. You see here in verse 5, In love, writes St. Paul, In love He predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with His pleasure and His will. Just got a little question for you this morning. How often do you think of yourself as a son or daughter of God? How often? Once a week? Perhaps on Sunday? Once a year? How about never? Because some people have never thought of themselves as a child of God at all. You don't feel worthy to be a son or daughter of God. And you say, Pastor, you don't know what I've done. Maybe I don't. But God does. Amen. And God still loves you. Amen. And God loves me. Regardless of what we've done, He loves you. Amen. He wants you to know that. Yeah, but I'm just one little speck. Oh, 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 remember, we don't think in terms of universal, we think in terms of individual, because the more you know about someone, the more you think about them in those terms. So God knows you right where you are. <coughs> Larry Crabb writes about a therapist who used to assemble a group and play a game he used to call Top Secret. And he'd ask the people in this group to write down one thing about 
themselves that they were least inclined to share. The one thing that nobody knew about them. And then turn the paper in unsigned. <laughs> said over the years, one answer consistently emerged as the most frequently admitted top secret. And it was usually phased or phrased something like this. I feel utterly worthless. No one would want me if they knew me. Hmm. Well, I can tell you this morning who wants you. God wants you. Amen. <laughs> you are far from worthless this morning. God sees you as having unimaginable value to Him and His kingdom. You can't even think that way. Indeed, you're so valuable. You're so valuable that God gave His Son <coughs> for you and for me. That's how valuable you are. In fact, in his book entitled Love Beyond the Reason, John Ortberg tells a story many of you parents can relate to. I found it interesting. It's the story of Pandy. Now, Pandy belonged to <coughs> John Ortberg's sister, Barbie. She was his sister's favorite doll, Pandy. Wherever Barbie Ortberg went, Pandy went too. And after years of, of devoted love for Barbie, Pandy was a mess. But Barbie never noticed her ugliness. <coughs> Pandy was still her favorite doll. One year, the family went on vacation. They went to, up into Canada. And on their way back to Illinois, Barbie realized that Pandy was missing. The family had already traveled hundreds of miles, but Mr. Ortberg turned the car around and the whole family headed back to Canada to retrieve that little ugly doll, Pandy. Mr. Ortberg knew that his daughter would not rest until she had her doll back. And so the whole Ortberg family willingly made this long trip back to Canada because they knew the love of Barbie had for her little doll, Pandy. No wonder John Ortberg calls it love beyond reason. Love beyond reason. Go hundreds of miles back to retrieve a doll? <laughs> Send your beloved son into a dark and cruel world for the love of creatures like you and me? It doesn't make any sense. And yet, that is the good news. As we begin this new year, my friends, God loves us just that much. Amen. I, I, wish, I wish there was a way I could stamp that on your foreheads, on your minds. I mean, I wish I could. There was a TV commercial some years back, I think, says it all. In fact, I want you to watch it just for a minute, would you please? saw the cowboy with the 
huge scar around his eye and something wrong with the eye itself. There was a fellow with a cauliflower ear from wrestling. Another with horribly calloused feet. There's no explanation at all given in the commercial. Just simply the Nike swoosh and the words, just do it. That ad was analyzed and criticized very widely several years ago. And there was a writer, Jim Cogman, who says, as being incomprehensible and extreme, this ad was criticized. But the key to this controversial commercial lies in the background music. Joe Cocker singing, You are so beautiful to me. To these athletes, the wrestler with the cauliflower ear, the surfer with the sharp bite, bull rider in one eye, blind in one eye, and they're <coughs> those things that <coughs> we saw. Their injuries are actually beauty marks. <coughs> and to their fans, these athletes are beautiful because of their scars. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder says Mike Foligno, the ads creator. And the writer Congdon says, God's grace is just as jarring and controversial. Why? Because our beauty is not found in us, but in Him. Amen. Our beauty is not found in us, but in Him. Do we understand that? What God wants us to see. He, he looks down at us, injured, blind, scarred, all kinds of baggage, messed up, royally, some of us. <laughs> and he sings, you are so beautiful to me. You are so beautiful to me. Can't you see? We may be time worn like Barbie Orford's doll candy. We may be sin broken and bruised like the fellow with the cauliflower ear. But that's not how God sees us. I'm here to remind us this morning because of our commitment to Christ. God sees us as new creations. That's how God sees us. And because God sees us as a new creation, that is how, by His grace, we can enter this new year of 2016. That the slate has been wiped clean. And it's time to begin to write a new chapter in the book of our lives. A new chapter. That God loves us. And it's time for us to begin living fully and wonderfully in the wonder of that knowledge and knowledge of that love for us. Amen. God wants you to know you are special. Amen. You are loved. You belong to Him. <laughs> Praise His name. Aren't you glad for His Aren't you glad for His love this morning? Aren't you glad for His word to remind us of that this morning? Amen. Wow. And what better way, what better way for us to end this service reminded of God's love for us than to share in communion together. Here it is on this day, the first Sunday of 2016. And you know what? Every one of us who is here this morning had the opportunity to do, to say, we've been in church every Sunday this year. 